All right, welcome to the Library of Congress. Um, I'm Nicole Saylor, I'm the director of the American Folklife Center, and we are thrilled to have you with us tonight as we celebrate the life's work of the Kitchen Sisters, award-winning audio producers Davia Nelson and Nikki Silva, who've been chronicling cultures and traditions across the American soundscape since 1979. Woo, yes. Uh, <laughs> Their photos, journals, and more than 7,000 hours of audio recordings will be archived at the American Folklife Center here at the Library of Congress. So, yeah, right? Um, so, the acquisition of the sisters, uh, Kitchen Sisters collection reflects the importance that the library places on storytelling and personal narratives and, our, and on our commitment to highlighting diverse communities and grassroots voices throughout the U.S. as we strive to enrich and expand the public record. Uh, this event is being recorded as part of the AFC's ongoing Benjamin A. Botkin Lecture Series and will soon be available for viewing on the library's website. So now would be a great time for me to remind you to please turn off your electronic devices so you don't make history. All right. Um, so tonight is going to be super special. Uh, Davy and Nikki will be interviewed by their longtime collaborator, the award-winning actor Frances McDormand, uh, an amazing storyteller in her own right. For nearly four decades, the Kitchen Sisters have researched and produced hundreds of audio stories, radio specials, and podcasts documenting America's diverse cultural history and contemporary cultural landscape. Recipients of a DuPont Columbia Award, two Peabody Awards, to Webby Awards, to Jane Beers Awards. Uh, the, the Kitchen Sisters' popular uh, nationwide NPR series and PRX programs include Lost and Found Sound, the Sonic Memorial Project, and Hidden Kitchens. Uh, other Kitchen Sisters series include The Hidden World of Girls, and a favorite of archivists such as myself, uh, The Keepers, which uh, features stories about activist archivists, rogue librarians, curators, collectors, and quote, protectors of the free flow of information and ideas. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so in addition to her radio, podcast, and documentary career, Davia Nelson has also been involved in numerous films and documentary projects. Over the years, she has worked as a feature film casting director for such notable filmmakers as Francis Ford Coppola, Wes Anderson, and Luis Valdez. Uh, she is much in demand on stage interviewer for film and arts festivals and is currently working with Nikki Silva on their latest book called Show the Girls the Snakes, The Twelve Commandments of Storytelling. <laughs> yeah, you'll hear more about that later maybe. Uh, in addition to her radio career, Nikki Silva has worked as history curator at the Museum of Art and History in Santa Cruz and as a freelance exhibit consultant. She has created more than 40 exhibits for regional parks libraries and museums throughout California on topics as diverse as California's agricultural labor history, Chinese Americans in the Monterey Bay region, California Indian basket makers, and the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. Frances McDormand has served as the voice of many Kitchen Sisters podcasts and NPR specials over the past 15 years. She's acted in some 40 films and has received four Academy Awards, including three for Best Actress and one for producing 20, the 2020 best picture, Nomadland. Uh, on stage, her accomplishments are equally as impressive. She's received Tony, Drama Desk, Outer Critics Circle Awards, and has garnered other theater credits to numerous to mention. She is a member of the Director's Circle of the Wooster Group, and her company, Hearsay Productions, has created many award-winning productions. Um, I mean, I could go on about the many accomplishments of all three of tonight's speakers, but I know you would rather hear from them so please join me in welcoming Nikki Silva, Davia Nelson, and Frances McDormand. Most of you in this room have worked on these pieces with us and been part of it, so here's the applause to you right back. Thank you so much. So much collaboration in this room. Can't even stand it. 
you can stand it. So I'm, I'm just going to start the way I usually do when I record with these women, which is like this. The Kitchen Sisters, Davia Nelson and Nikki Silva, or The Kitchen Sisters, Nikki Silva and Davia Nelson. <laughs> there are two of them. Two opinions, two minds and spirits, two approaches to storytelling. Two women doing this work across four decades. Two women who met in their 20s and who have had a partnership that has evolved and now extends to a large global community. A community whose stories don't often see the light of day. Stories that have a soul and an edge. Stories that are intimate and deeply layered with sound, music, archival audio, and field recordings. They reveal rarely known quarters of history, stories that are full of spirit and fill our spirit. The contributions of the sisters' loyal listeners have led them to unexpected stories and into surprising collaborations with callers around the nation. They call this vast and growing network of friends, colleagues, and collaborators the Kitchen Sisterhood. <laughs> Welcome to you, the Kitchen Sisterhood. This show is for you, but also includes you. So get ready to participate. So last night, the, the ladies told me about these events that are happening around the world called close listening. People gather in a room together and listen. And that's what we're going to do tonight. Listen. So... They want to get right to their stories, and we're going to do that, but I really like the personal stuff. So tape everything that moves. Words to live by. Words to live by. But you did start somewhere as 20-year-old women. We did. Tell us a little something about that, <laughs> Nick. We were in Santa Cruz, California. We had both gone to the University of California at Santa Cruz, but we didn't know each other then. And I was working in the Santa Cruz City Museum doing history exhibits and art exhibits, and Davia was working in radio at the local community station doing a show. And our town was just really changing. I mean, there was so much going on in the town. It had been a sleepy little tourist retirement town, and suddenly this university had arrived, like in 1965, just a few years before we got there. And there was some strife and changes. And I think Davy and I were both kind of really drawn to that and interested in the history and, and interested in what was changing and why. And so we were both sort of on the same track, but we didn't know each other yet. I, um, when I was in high school, I was the noon disc jockey. And I wrote my high school career notebook on either being a disc jockey or the first woman on the Supreme Court. <laughs> and I think it was always music and justice. It also, I would say the Supreme Court is a stone's throw from here, so I'm having a moment tonight, <laughs> having all these things come together. Um, but uh, I'd gone to school and I was thinking pre-law, you know, in preparation for my role as a justice. And it was the, the Vietnam era, and there was so much, and we were in, as Nikki says, we were in this town that had been so transformed by this radical new experimental university that had come to town in the UC system. You see Santa Cruz, and there were just demonstrations constantly against the war, and you could just see the faces of people who had lived there for so long and were in these really traditional fishing, lumbering, all these kind of Italian midwives, these traditional uh, trades and jobs of that region. And I, when I graduated, it was very clear at a certain point in the middle of college, I just started hanging out at the radio station. I kind of let go of jurisprudence and just kind of went for the station. And um, I still cannot figure out, I'm going to go, how did I, I don't know how I found that cassette. 
recorder. I don't know where I got the 25-foot cord. I don't know how I got that microphone, but I started walking the land with that and just finding elders in the community to talk to. And every single time I'd go to anybody's house, they'd do the interview with me and they'd talk and then they'd say, do you know this woman, Nikki Silva? She was here a week ago collecting my Indian baskets. Like, and then I'd show up at someone else's house to talk with them about apple drying and that tradition, and they'd say at the end of the interview, Do you, have you ever met this young woman, Nikki, over at the Santa Cruz City Museum? And then I fell in love with this guy, and he said to me, he started watching what I was doing. He's actually here tonight. And he said to me, Do you, um, have you ever met this woman, Nikki Silva? <laughs> It was like that cinched it. Just so, let the guy say something. And so I called her up at the museum, and I went over, and we met, and we were supposed to. She told me she had a half hour. She squeezed me in, and we came at two in the afternoon, and we began to talk. And we think that it ended at about eight o'clock that night, and we just began walking the path together from that point on, and just getting into radio and beginning the begin. And tell me about Tape Everything That Moves. It's so obvious. <laughs> <laughs> and do we have that? We have that photograph later of you taping Everything That Moves. We can go back. That one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, come on, because that's the, this is. <laughs> but there are so many radio producers in this room who know that you don't just want the interview, you want the sound, you want the sizzle, you're trying to evoke a feeling of time and place, and what better than shrimp, shrimp. Or, <laughs> or grackles or car radio or all those things that, you know, and they're also like the olive oil and the cream, you know, when you're cooking and you're binding everything together, that's what all those underbeds of sound. Yeah, and I, as you experienced when you were walking in and, and sitting here waiting for us to come out, the music soundscape that they create is always really evocative of the worlds. Uh, radio is, to me, is a living thing, Sam Phillips. And for, maybe for the unfortunate people in this audience who might not know who Sam Phillips is, you better tell him, you poor things. <laughs> Okay, um, okay. I pulled out one of my sound logs, um, sound journals that will soon be in the Library of Congress. Um, this is uh, from 1997. Living in Memphis, working on the set of Francis Ford Coppola's film, The Rainmaker, doing casting, which I did for about 15 years in the midst of making radio with Nikki. A guy is standing next to me watching the shot, great hair, cool smile. In the long setup between takes, we started talking. I admire the furniture on the set. He tells me that's why he's on the set. The furniture belongs to his father and comes from his office. We start talking about Memphis, about barbecue, about music. I tell them about a radio series Nikki and I are about to start with NPR for the turn of the century, the millennium, lost and found sound how sound shapes history, and history is shaped by sound. Stories of vanishing voices, sound on the verge of extinction, people possessed by sound. The guy with the hair listens and says, girl, I think you better come over to the house and meet my dad. He started Sun Studios and the Memphis Recording Service. He recorded Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, Roy Orbison, B.B. King, Rufus Thomas. And you better come meet my mother, Becky. She and my dad started the first all-girl radio station in the nation in Memphis in 1955. They called it WHER 1000 Beautiful Watts. <laughs> Nikki, Nikki was on a plane to Memphis the next day. That evening we drove to the home of San Phillips. We arrived at seven and left after midnight. If you look at the transcript from that interview, which will soon be in the Library of Congress, <laughs> You'll see that we asked one question, and about three hours later, we got to ask another. <laughs> Sam was on fire. He told us that he had taken the money he got from selling Elvis's contract in 1955 and created this groundbreaking station and put it inside the third Holiday Inn ever built. It was five hours of some of the best storytelling we ever heard. 
the movie wrapped. We were back in San Francisco, armed with the names of a few of WHER's pioneering disc jackets, and commenced a search. Betty Berger, Janie Joplin, Marge Thrasher, Dean the Hat Duvall. The names took on a kind of magic as we tried to find them and record their stories. The saga of the station was nearly forgotten and had never really been told. Each woman led us to another. After digging for two years, we found 21 of the 40 women who worked at the station over the course of its 20-year history and interviewed them all. It was a lost sonic sorority. We realized in some strange ways these women were our four mothers, and it was up to us to tell this little known corner of American broadcast history. We want to kick off tonight with a short slice of our story, W-H-E-R, 1,000 Beautiful Watts. As you listen, imagine that there, okay. Imagine. As you listen, imagine that there are some 80 hours of interviews and archival audio that we collected to tell this story. Here we go. Focus on my face, Davia. <laughs> and I'm going to put my glasses on. See? Here we go. We wanted to kick off tonight with a short slice of our story, W-H-E-R, 1,000 Beautiful Watts. As you listen, as you listen, imagine that there are some 80 hours of interviews and archival audio that we collected to tell this story. Photographs, graphics, air checks. It's all coming here to be preserved as part of the nation's sonic history, a story from the B-side of history. Good morning. This is WHER Radio, America's first all-girl radio station, Memphis, Tennessee. WHER 1430 kilocycles with full power of 1,000 watts as authorized by the Federal Communications Commission, Washington, D.C. We cordially invite you to stay tuned to WHER Radio all day, every day. We signed on October the 29th, 1955. The thing was, nobody knew that we were going to be all girl. Each girl thought she was going to be the only girl on the radio station. Dottie Abbott, who I hired as general manager, I told Dottie, and she almost shouted, I don't believe you, Sam. I know you're crazy, but you're not that crazy. You know, I mean, she was just beside herself. You were invading man's territory. I mean, you were supposed to be a guest or something if you're going to do anything as a woman on radio. This is WHER Radio, America's first all-girl radio station for sparkling, bright music. I'm Becky Phillips, day, and I was one of the original WHER girls. At the first, Dottie Abbott was experienced. Marion Keisker was experienced, and I had been in radio. The other girls were mostly new, like Barbara Gurley and uh, Bobby Stout. And My uh, wife, Faye Becky, uh, that's how I met her in radio. We were both kids in high school. We worked part-time at a little station in Alabama, our hometown. I'm Sam Phillips, and I'd wanted a radio station all my life. Radio, to me, it's, it's a living thing. My name is Betty Berger. My career started in 1956 when I went to work for WHER. Sam's wife, Becky, has a beautiful radio voice. And I think Sam recognized that, thinking, well, what would that sound like? Women playing records and music and talking and saying commercials and doing the news. That's, that's different. There just weren't many women's voices back then. Maybe some of the radio stations would have one woman who worked there. WREC's charming women's reporter, Kitty Kelly. We have with us in the studio one of the greatest living musicians, and I think one of the great musicians of all time, Mr. Sigmund Romberg. Good morning, Mr. Romberg. Uh, Kitty, you are flattered. Lily, I mean, you flatter me very much when you say I'm one of the greatest living composers. Of course I'm living. <laughs> I love to live. Wonderful. <laughs> if you would, uh, we'd like to know a little bit about uh, your outlook on music in this country. Tell me, did you ever explain to the listening audience that you have a wonderful smile, that you have blonde hair, and you have a red hat on now and everything? <laughs> no, I didn't. Why didn't you? <laughs> 
because I think the people that come to our microphone are much more interesting, and especially you. But I'm, wait a second, darling. I mean, I'm interested in you now. <laughs> the smile and the, and the twinkle in your, the twinkle in your eyes. Tell me, Kitty, are you married? <laughs> no, I'm not. Mr. Well, now, wait a second. Now. Tell me, Kitty, I mean, how long are you in Memphis now? Oh, all my life. But if I may say so, if you want to talk about me, I'd like to tell you of a very important part that you and your music played in my life. Don't rush me, Kitty. <laughs> now, how long are you in Memphis? Well, Mr. Romberg, I've been here quite a while. Country dance was being held in a garden. I felt a bump and heard an oh, beg your pardon. Suddenly, I saw polka dots and moonbeams. I really love that um, all the music in, in the piece, this hour long story, is from the actual radio station. And Becky Phillips had kept all of the albums, and so we had the honor of just kind of selecting each little piece to go. And it moves through time, the whole piece, because they started in 55 and ended in the early 70s, and it really, um, you time travel, and Martin Luther King and uh, all that happened, and that was really the first time they went on the air as real journalists, and people were calling them from all over the world. Yeah, that was get the that's story. a great part of the story. Yeah, it's a great part of the story. Because they were the ones that were willing to go out on the street. Yes. And hit the beat because everyone else was doing something else, right? So the ladies hit the beat during that. Yeah, so this is the last time that you met with them. These are all the ladies that you could find to get together? Um, you know, it was really interesting, and it happens with almost all our stories. We put the, that story on the air, and then the call started flowing in, probably twice as many women found us after the initial story had aired. One woman pulled over in Florida, I remember, and the Florida station called us that day. She had, Dot Fisher, she had called the Florida station saying, I worked at WHER, I need to be part of this. These are all my friends. And so she reunited with them and she, we did an oral history with her. So it just kept, one led to another. We always say stories beget stories. Stories beget stories, which leads to something that I just realized when we were talking about this tonight, that you have kind of gathered different commandments, you call them, and you keep them in your minds as you were doing shows and series throughout the, the last 40 years. And we're going to have a few of them, the 12 commandments of storytelling. But Nikki, you were saying there's probably 25 there's or probably, 30 by now. Yeah, we change them all the time, depending on what we're doing and where we're going and who we're seeing. <laughs> exactly. But what's so great is that you've just seen, you know, those are the shoulders, those are the beautiful shoulders that you're standing on that were the women of radio, early radio. And then just give us a taste of one of your first stories and how you got to it? Well, one of the first commandments is talk to strangers. And um, <laughs> and here's Davia's, a stranger. Davia's, Davia's, Davia's father taught us that. Uh, Davia grew up with a wonderful dad who insisted that she talk to people and took her into the back rooms of cigar houses and bars and all sorts of places to meet the people. So she brought that to the group. And how'd you meet the Road Ranger? The Road Ranger. Well, I was buying some milk at... Uh, as one does. As one does. At the uh, local convenience stores that's in the KOA campground below our house. And Just let me say that Nikki lives on a commune and uh, has for how many years? about as long as we've been together, <laughs> 40 or so. So she, the KOA is down the road from the commune where right. we go to get milk. It's the closest place. And I walk in, and here's this guy, and he's got these... In that outfit. In this very outfit. <laughs> he's got these boots and this belt that says the Road Ranger, and he's got this hat, hat and shades. He's buying Marlboros and Coke for the road. And out front is idling this Ford Ranchero pickup truck that says the Road Ranger, um, champion of the stranded traveler. Scourge of the tow hook and the long delay. And I mean, so Davy and I are now working together, uh, you know, recording people and thinking about stories. And, I, you know, it made me so nervous to talk to him. It's not easy to go up and talk to people, but talk to strangers, you know. And needless to say, you forgot about the milk. 
I forgot about the milk. Yeah. I was no more so milk. astonished. And he handed me his card when I asked him about, you know, the ro what do you do? What kind of work do you do? And, and he, told, he told me that, uh, you know, he had been a Vietnam vet, and uh, he had come back from the war, and it kind of was, didn't really want to take his uniform off, I guess. It kind of became a costumed crusader. And he would drive Highway 17, which is this real rugged road in Santa Cruz, and lots of accidents and breakdowns. And he would, he would save stranded travelers. He would, for free, he would just do this. He would just roll. And so I said, well, wow. Do you, you know, we do radio. Do you think? We might be able to come with you someday. And the next weekend was 4th of July, and he invited us on patrol. You, ro you rode with them. You rode with them. We rode with them. Wow, that's a, that is an honor. It was. <laughs> and he, he, yeah. He, the other thing, along with the commandments, we sort of have tips. And I, we went out on, it was July 4th, I was just remembering this as you're telling <laughs> the story, and I had new white pants. And, well, yeah, that's a good outfit for recording a mechanic. And <laughs> the road ranger, you know, he traveled, as he said, with 700 pounds of vehicle-saving devices. And he just patrolled this 10-mile stretch of highway up and down. He was done the, was the Vietnam War again, and he was out of the Army, but he was not done serving. He still needed a uniform. He still needed to be on a mission, which I think... Early on, uh, that became sort of who we were looking for and the kind of stories we wanted to tell people who, you know, some people run for elected office and some people elect themselves to serve their community. And the Road Ranger was definitely one of those. He wanted to make the world a better place. And Let's this, hear from him. Also, can we just say, as you listen to this, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. It was like the first time we'd been out. <laughs> and it was, yeah, I mean, this is the first piece of ours that was ever on NPR. Sound is so rugged, we taught ourselves to mix. It's cassettes and reel-to-reel, -reel, the, the analog years, we call them. We made it all up. We made a million mistakes. So when you're going, gee, the sound's not great. It's not. <laughs> but the Road Ranger is. Yeah. Oh, we met at Denny's, by the way. Never record in a restaurant. I go on the road looking for trouble, and whenever I find some, I stop. I suppose that's why they call me the bloodhound of breakdown, but then my business is trouble. What are you equipped to do? It would be easy to say, what am I not equipped to do? Uh, if your engine blows up, I cannot rebuild it for you. If your transmission uh, goes bad, there's very little that I can do. If your spark is gone, I can restore it. If you're suffering from fuel starvation, then I can make sure that gas gets to your carburetor. Uh, I find that most people invent fairy tales about what they think is wrong with their car. Mechanical ignorance is tantamount. We have a, a crisis of mechanical knowledge in this country. Can you tow a person's automobile? No, I don't tow anything. Uh, I suppose that's why I'm also known as the scourge of the tow hook and the long delay. You see, I prevent towing. How did you first get into this line of work? When I was 17, I decided I wanted to become a general. I enlisted in the United States Army. I love adventure. Uh, glory is my meat and potatoes. So when the Army lost the glory and adventure, they lost Sergeant Little. And uh, now the world has the Road Ranger and glory and adventure my daily diet again. So you'll have to go listen to that. And it'll be here in the Library of Congress. Much more of that to hear. Um, I want, can I say one more thing? So a, f a few years back, the Road Ranger passed. And um, I got a call from his stepmother, who lives pretty close by to us. And she invited us to the wake. And so, okay, yes, we go to the wake. There, hanging there, is his uniform and his hat and his belt buckle. 
and his road ranchero, Ford Rancheros out there. And there in the middle of the table is a cassette player. And all these people are in the room, and his stepmother said, we want to play this story because it so captured the road ranger. And so it became kind of the centerpiece of this wake, which was the ultimate compliment, I think. Absolutely. Nice. Every, every hero should be so lucky to have that archive. As you see, we, these are, that's the analog, remember that? Look how beautiful it is. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't that little dots? It's like, look how obsessed we are. <laughs> Led, Led Inglesman, 500 interviews later, we were just obsessed with this cowboy who, we were obsessed with him and he was obsessed with his dog. <laughs> Every, and we could not get him off his dog. But he was a, such a great storyteller. He could, he could tell you, the best story about his dog. I mean, we would record every one of them. So we've got a lot of dog stories. Another thing that's really important to us, and it goes back to even um, talking about tape everything that moves, we, along with trying to capture the story of people and the story of the country, we've always been trying to capture the soundscape, the soundtrack of America, the sound, you know, natural sounds. I mean, this is from Nikki's collection, Stereo Sound, Crickets, Ocean, Sprinklers. I really want to hear Chick Sprinklers. Oh, the sprinklers. sprinklers. You know, sprinklers. sprinklers, it's an endangered species. The sprinklers. <laughs> Seriously, try to find a rainbird, like from back in 1984. Like you remember. That, that yeah. is dead as a doornail. <laughs> you know, you have, these are, you don't even think about these things, but the Lost and Found Sound series brought that up. But also, if you're trying to tell stories, also there's that great quote of Plato's, he who controls rhythm controls, or we always say she who controls rhythm controls. But so in our storytelling, we're always looking for those kind of sounds in which to build from and to create the tension or the the rhythm of the story. Yeah, you, ju you just brought up, uh, actually, the Lost and Found Sound, which ended up being a series that you did, but it really started with the literal idea of finding things that had been lost, or people had thought had been lost, such as this, this recording. recording. Tell us about this recording. So with our radio show, we played a lot of music, so we were always on the hunt for, you know, old jazz and whatever we could find. And my dad, in his infamous garage that was full of anything you could ever want, had my mom's old 78s, uh, boxes of 78s, and he gave them to us. And we went through them, and we pulled this out, this record with this handwritten label, Louis, um, from Mrs. B, play this side first. And we didn't know who Louis was, and we didn't know who Mrs. B was. We've been looking for them ever since. But um, we took them to the station, and we played it on the 78 record player. And there was this woman who, who just appeared, the 1940s appeared. She's speaking to her husband from her kitchen, who's his, her husband's overseas uh, during World War II. And the breath, the air, everything about that recording captured the feeling and the moment and the time and the place. She says, Emil, Emil says we'll ski in 43 G, Lou, I hope so. Stay out of those bars and away from those barmaids. <laughs> she's worried about him going to the pubs. And she's buying a new coat, living with his mother. And, and then on the, on the flip side, on the B side, she sings to him. Yeah, fish gotta swim, birds gotta fly. I gotta love one man till I die. And she has a beautiful voice. Well, we were transported, puddled and, puddled. puddled, and became obsessed and began searching for these home recordings that you could make. The thing looks like a record player, and uh, you would just record into it back in the day. And that led you to Lost and Found Sound. Well, what it really led us to was the Library of Congress. <laughs> but truly, I mean, we were, when Nikki says obsessed, that's the understatement. I mean, we just started crawling into the archives, Stanford Archive of Recorded Sound. Some, I was asking Nikki, how did we get on a plane 
decide to get on a plane, come to the Library of Congress, come to the National Archives. We, this was late 70s, and we just, at that point, you could basically bring your cassette, get an RCA cord, plug into the reel-to-reel, -reel, and it was like a fire hose of archival audio. There were still card catalogs, and we would just read one after another, Ku Klux Klan sings barbershop quartets. <laughs> Better think about that story. Uh. Carmen Miranda, 1948 beer commercial, highest paid woman in the world, on and on. And we just, Christmas tree lighting, 1939, Interviews at the White from House. Corrigador. I mean, we're kind of going. And on, and we just would download it, take it all home, and then start making stories. And that ultimately leads to Lost and Found Sound all those years later. Collaboration is king, or in this case, queen. And you realized that well, we got that this. could have paralyzed you, that much information. That could have paralyzed you, but it galvanized you in some way. Yeah, the millennium was coming, going back to that story of WHER, and there was suddenly interest. And I don't know if he's in the room yet, but Chris Turpin and Art Silv... Art, are you here? Is Art here in the house tonight? People that we've collaborated with on these series, we did... About a thousand people came together to do that big project we described, Lost and Found Sound, of looking at how sound shaped history, history shaped sound, and it was for two years, every week on All Things Considered. And our main collaborator on it was Jay Allison, people, one of the sort of the, the hero. Abraham Lincoln of public the radio. Hero. Can you see that logo again? It's nice to see the logo. Mm -hmm. We called it, yeah, Lost and Found Sound. Well, there were so there. many photographers who were trying to kind of capture the century and images, and it just seemed like such a time to try to do the same thing with sound. I mean, so much happened in that century in sound. So along with us looking and what we've done with all our series on public radio is open up a phone line and ask listeners nationwide and around the world to collaborate with us and tell us about the stories of you know what we're looking for. And Jay Allison, our main collaborator on this project, uh, became the curator of the quest for sound. So this is one of the stories that came from that collaboration. Nine was received at 5.40 p.m. Friday. Hello, my name is Henry Cordova. I'm calling about a old record that I have in my possession, a recording of my grandfather's voice. My grandfather was a professional orator, a reader, a lector, as they call them. He read to the cigar workers in Tampa, Florida, while they hand-rolled cigars. On Friday, January 29th, Henry Cordova was listening to All Things Considered on Miami's WLRN as he drove home from work. I'm Jay Allison, curator of The Quest for Sound, and on that broadcast, I asked people to call in with stories of their home recordings of the last 100 years. Hello, Blanche, Frank. Henry did. That's his grandmother, Marina. Inspired by Henry's message, producers Davia Nelson and Nikki Silva, the Kitchen Sisters, began to explore the cigar culture of Southern Florida, drawing on the legacy of audio artifacts, oral histories, and memories of this lost tradition of story and smoke. Listen, friends, I would like to see you again very soon. Our narrator is actor Andy Garcia. Cigar stories, elector, he who reads. My grandfather came to Key West, uh, got a job as a reader in the cigar factories. The Cuban cigar industry had moved to Key West to escape political troubles in Cuba during the Spanish-American War. Uh, later went to the Spanish part of Tampa called Ybor City, which was named after Martinez Ibor, a uh, Cuban tobacco mogul. The height of the industry, there were about 100 cigar factories, each employing several hundred people. So there was a lot of market for professional readers. And if a man had a good voice and a good selection of material, he would get fans and he'd be in high demand. The lectures began in Sevilla. In order for a worker to sit there and roll a cigar, which is really a monotonous task, something had to be done to uh, entertain them. They brought on a man to read. When you finish making a cigar, you put the wrapper on it. It's really a delicate thing 
that makes or breaks a cigar. And the glue that the women in Sevilla used was the sweat of their thighs. It was very hot in the factories, and they were sweaty. When the leaf came to the final wrapping, they would rub it on the inside of their thigh. That would cause it to stick. I went to work when I was 15. It was 1924, Tampa. Cigar roller, Eugenia Preve. I made 150 cigars a day. When the summer came, we were hot. We sweated like pigs. I worked by hand for at least 30 years. And we had an hour and a half in the morning of lecture. They talked of everything that happened in the world. Whenever there was a good article anywhere, they would come and read it to us. Mm. That Thank is, you. You know, we used to drive around in Davia's Green Dots, and, and all these messages were on a CD. And, uh, you know, we'd listen and we'd think about, oh, that would be a good one to do. And then we'd make dibs because Jay might want to do it or Joe Richmond might want to, All our collaborators, everyone was wanting to do the stories that were coming in over the telephone, but we got this one. Can you tell me one that got away? Hmm. Oh, Jay got to do... Um, well... They ended up where they were supposed they, to end they, up. They, the proper people did them. So we're going to listen to another one. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it before we listen? At sound check, I started sobbing when I tried yeah. that. And I'll just say why, so hopefully I won't cry again. Um, this is a story uh, called French Manicure Tales uh, from Vietnamese nail salons in America. And we were in the middle of a lost and found sound gathering of how sound shaped history and history shaped by sound. A lot of Kitchen Sisters stories are found in taxi cabs, a lot are found in hair salons, a lot are found in... Give me your hand. <laughs> <laughs> in nail salons. Yes. A lot are found in nail salons. I highly recommend taxi cabs, nail salons, and beauty parlors as rich sources of story for anyone. Um, I, there was one JT Nails in San Francisco, and I'd been going for a while, and there was a woman named Shirley. And Shirley had a daughter named Crystal, and at a certain point, this was back in 1999, I guess this is, 2000, um, and all of a sudden one day I looked at Shirley and I said, um, what was your name in Vietnam? You know, how you, you know, where does Shirley come from? And she told this harrowing story of fleeing from Vietnam, going to try and escape with her mother and her brother, getting separated from her family, um, winding up in San Francisco somehow by herself in a hospital being taken care of by nuns and there was a television in the room. She said to watching the television during the day there'd be this black and white tele these black and white movies. She didn't know what they were saying, but there was this little girl who was so happy and she said to herself, I'm in America now and I'm alone and I have to be happy. And she asked somebody who was the little girl and the little girl was Shirley Temple. And so she took her name from that. And Nikki and I just started thinking about all the ways what people are hearing and seeing is shaping them and changing their lives. And so we just started going to nail salon after nail salon with our microphone and beginning this chronicle. And so, uh, and I started. I'm just very happy to think that their stories are going to the Library of Congress. I have to say that, that there's a lot of Vietnamese manicurists coming in to the LOC. <laughs> Bye. Bàn tay. The hand. Chân. The foot. Thanh lịch. Cao nhã. Elegant. Good morning, sweetie. This is a freshman class. Okay, that's the beginning. 
of the school. I have to explain everybody how to use your tools, uh, what is the, the chemicals, and the creams, and the acetone, and I can explain the whole thing at this time. My name is Maria Elena Alvarado. We are in Hilltop Beauty School in Daly City at the top of the hill. Welcome to the world of the cosmetology, honey. You like code, darling, please? Your page is 419. Who can define what the mean the word is manicure? For Latin word. You're right. It's a manus and cure the care of the hands and nails. The majority here is an immigrant. The majority. A lot of Vietnamese is in the school. They take a class for the yes for manicure. The Vietnamese they have a something in your hands. Don't tell me why. Every time they touch your hands you can feel. It's something special in her hands. Nhà chỗ ở. The home. Cảm giác. The feeling. Âm thanh. The sound. I am a lineman for the county. I left Vietnam in 1972. I listened to the radio when I was in high school. I still in Vietnam at that time. I lost a U.S. troop during the Vietnam War. I really love the song, you know, played by uh, Grant Campbell, Wichita Lyman's, and uh, all the songs from GBG, from Beatles, Rolling Stone. I love. When I was young, I heard a song, you know, California Dream. I thought, wow, San Francisco, everybody wearing their flower in their hair. I make my wish. When I grow up, I like to come to the United States. I like to live in San Francisco. See, I can get flower on my hair. That's a California Dreaming, the song. But when I come here in 1979, oh, it is hard. I have no relative, just like a couple friends, they help me. I'm not able to be speaking very, very well. So every day when I'm driving, I put a tap in my radio so I'm listening. Fancy nails in Berkeley? Oh, Lisa. This is me, Lisa, the owner of the Fancy Nail. Yeah, okay, so I will see you at 1.30. There's something to... 2000, mm -hmm. and then the next year is. Mm -hmm. So we were in the midst of the Lost and Found Sound Project uh, when 9-11 hit. And um, it sort of, like with us all, paralyzed us, and it seemed impossible to go forth with the stories we were all working on at that moment, like what could we possibly do? I mean, give blood, who knows, you know, what? but we had a collaboration in place. We had producers all over the country who were working on Lost and Found Sound. We were working with NPR. We were in this place where we could really focus on what was going on and the mood of the country. And so we sort of turned the lens of the project towards that. We opened up the phone line again and asked people to call with their memories and their shards of sound and their recordings, you know, elevator recordings and the sound of the escalators and the revolving doors and, and the concerts that took place in the, in the quad and uh, these things just came in. And, and over the next year, we produced these stories, all of us, this big collaboration, um, Joe Richman, and uh, Ben Shapiro did this beautiful story about Radio Row, which was the neighborhood that was there in uh, where the Twin Towers were built. We decided to focus on the neighborhood and the history and the life of the neighborhood of the Twin Towers. And they did this wonderful piece um, memorializing that uh, early neighborhood that was lost. And um, there was a story about the people who fell in love and got married on top of the towers. And uh, there was also the story that we produced with Jamie York about the Mohawk iron workers who um, built the tr uh, trade towers. And then when 9-11 happened, their nephews and sons came back and dismantled it 
after after 9-11. We're going to put, you all are getting, you, you're understanding that we're playing little excerpts of these stories, right? That they're, they all... Much, much more. Okay, good. Waiting just to for say you. that as the story ends, I just want to say, but wait, there's more. Um, <laughs> this story, when I listen to this story, Jamie York, as we said, our collaborator, and before I even say that, also Joe Richmond, as Nikki said, created one of the great stories in this and series, Sue. and Sue J. Johnson, also, it had a companion website. It was the first time a website was ever given a Peabody Award. And Sue yeah. J. Johnson is here tonight, too, who commented that. So col collaboration is queen and king. And there they are, the king and the queen. Um, when you listen to this little excerpt from Walking High Steel, Jamie York uh, went to Canada, where a lot of the Mohawks uh, who built and dismantled the Trade Towers, lived, and would go back on the weekends. And we asked uh, the radio station, there's a, a radio station there on the reservation, and we asked if we could use what they played for those weeks after 9-11 uh, and during that time in all of their lives. And the, so the soundtrack of this is all radio station, all their playlists from the radio station from that time. Yo, we're on the guard. Yona, yona, dana, yo, dene, atse, asa. It's three right now outside our studios. That's the way it's going to be for the next couple of days or so. Don't forget Radio Bingo tonight. Ten thousand dollars. <laughs> Canona, they get the Twin Towers. The Twin Towers, they're twins. They nick them. That's a Mohawk. I'm a bird clan, huh? We go clan. Bill O'Hara Oaks from Akwesasne. Yeah, when I work in a World Trade Center, that was the year of 69. I was working up in New Jersey. You can see it from there, the tower was going up. They told me it's going to go up to 110 floors, huh? I said, I want to get on that building. Saturday night, 8 o'clock. The Gunnawaga Mohawk senior lacrosse team get back in action once again. Walter Bova here in the Gunnawaga Indian Reserve. 99% of the reservation are iron workers. My brother was, and my whole family was at one time. One of the elders takes you under their wing. You know, you, you got to learn how to crawl before you can walk. My name is Pete Lafleur, and I worked in the World Trade Center in 1969 and 70. I was a connector of steel. My mother's brother was a great iron worker. My grandfather worked on the Empire State Building. He worked in Brazil, he worked in France, San Francisco Bay Bridge. Weekends when they came home, you sat around the family, and that's all they all talked about. That's all you heard all your life. When you started working yourself, you could almost do the job because you, you were talking so much about it when you were a kid. My name is Randy Horn. I've been an iron worker for 33 years. The trade center was the most time I ever spent with my father, one-on-one. -on -one. I never really knew him. He was always away providing for his family. I learned to know him on the job. My father put me in the gang, start bolting up right away. Great perspective, great perspective on that, on those buildings. And, and so the... We, what, the next move was towards food. We needed to do something after a year of Sonic Memorial. Right. Something hopeful and something about bringing communities together some way. And Which was a huge part of your lives already in the commune and in your world. You have so many friends in, in, in the food world. But what's really great is the perspective, once again, that you took because it was about the hidden world of food, the hidden kitchens that people experience. Tell us about that cab ride, because I think that's one of the first stories that ever made me understand what you did when we first met. Um, I live in San Francisco, and I don't like to drive. I hate to drive. And um, every time, this is uh, two, or, or, so 2004 or so, every time I'd get into a yellow cab, I would notice that the driver was from Brazil. And not just from Brazil, but the same town in Brazil, Goiânia. And it ultimately turned out there were, at that time, 456 drivers 
from Goiânia working with Yellow Cab. And we had done two stories in Brazil, and I had studied some Portuguese and was obsessed with the music and obsessed with the food and would start talking to the cab drivers. You know, there's sort of food and music. They are the universal language, right? It's what draws people together. It's what crosses the divide. And anyway, I'd be talking with these drivers, and they'd say, well, you should really... I'd say, where's the best Brazilian food in town? And they'd say, you really should come to the yellow cab yard at midnight, because at midnight, Jeanette, she comes from their same town, from Goiânia, and she brings this rolling midnight night kitchen, and she begins to cook Brazilian food on the abandoned industrial street outside the cab yard. They say, just come, just look like you're a driver. Drive into the parking lot. Just, you know, look like you're a driver, and drive and walk out the other side. It's this vast, bombed out place and so I, I yeah like I, okay yeah all the drivers and that's it's this was a point in life where nobody was walking around with headphones on right especially big ones and you know 25 pounds of recording devices but midnight and I go and I come out the other end and it was just as they said there under the street life street light was this blaring beautiful Brazilian music Iranian cab drivers, uh, Russian cab drivers, Brazilian cab drivers on these little folding chairs, and Jeanette just cooking her heart out as she did every single night. Often her son was asleep in the car as she was cooking, and it was like a hidden kitchen vision. And Nikki and I started talking and said, well, if Jeanette is out on that street corner, who else is out gluing their community together through food? And and it set us on this course. So again, the phone line opened. Again, we just started searching for hidden kitchens. Message 23 was received at 1.10 p.m. today. I'm Margaret Engel, a woman who works for legal aid who's talking to me about how many of her clients get dinner. The people who struggle to even get food on the table because they don't have an official kitchen and who are using George Foreman grills and the like. The George Foreman grill has been an amazing success story as a kitchen appliance, but what I think many people don't realize is that immigrants and low-income people have contributed to that popularity. That is, to me, the epitome of the hidden kitchen. Wow. What a wonderful story. I'd never considered it at all. I'm George Foreman, two-time heavyweight champion of the world, former Olympic champion, and king of the grills. Growing up in Houston, Texas, my whole life was spent trying to get enough to eat. Having seven kids, my mother did, and there just was never enough food for me. I always dreamed about not a car, not a beautiful home, but enough to eat. My name Piggly Wiggly. I've got groceries on my shelf. My name is Jeffrey Newton, Chicago. I'm a great cook. A trait that I had learned from my grandmother, but I just haven't had a kitchen. I'm living in a shelter at this particular time, but I've been homeless all my life. I lived under Wacker Drive, where the expressway goes through, and there's about 30 or 40 refrigerator boxes down there. That's going to be your home. I would get a George Foreman grill. That's the grill that I had for a while under Wacker Drive. Me and a fellow by the name of Smokey. So you just get your long extension cord. Well, they got a lot of electrical plugs on the poles down there. And just hook up. We was making hamburgers and grilled cheese sandwiches. Because we used to take an iron and do that too. Press down, you know, and your bread and your cheese. My name is Pat Sherman, and I'm the program coordinator of the Walk-In Center here at Glide, San Francisco. When I was in the single room, I could perceive I couldn't cook in my room. Well, legally, I couldn't. I'd get me a big bowl, put me some ice in it, and voila, that became my refrigerator. Microwaves, toaster ovens, hidden under the bed or in the closet. The George Foreman grill, that's the newest thing. Doesn't set off the smoke detectors. And since they come in colors, you know, it just looks like you're getting real fancy in your room and decorating. And it looks like you have a nice tabletop to the visible eye, but you know it's your kitchen. It's a special TV offer from the king of the grill, George Foreman. My lean, mean, fat reducing grilling machine. I grew up in Houston, Texas, in the Fifth Ward area. Every day at lunch during the summer days, 
You hear the parents call the kids in. They would just tell me, okay, go home and eat your lunch. And these people knew I had no food at home. And I'd peep through the window at, at the kids eating. And the parents would peel the crust off the bread. And I would sit there and just hope they would just throw it out the window for me. Going to school, you go through the lunch line, 26 cents. I couldn't afford that. And I'd sit at the table, and it was so embarrassing. So what I would do, I'd get a greasy bag, blow it up on the way to school to make it look like there was a sandwich in it. Then I'd get to my classroom and say, boy, I ate my lunch. And I learned to disguise my not having food. When you're homeless, you have to find out all these things, you know. It's called trailblazing. You got to blaze the trail. You want to tell us about this next one? Go on. Uh, just say it out loud. Just say the name of it. I just love the name of it so much. Kibby at the crossroads. Oh, the Kibby. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were doing. Oh, go back. I'll make you say the next one when we get there. Kibby. Do Kibby. I'm so sorry. I got excited. I got ahead of myself, didn't you? <laughs> well, so. Okay, I can't wait to see what the, wait a minute, I'm gonna get a, should we get a sneak preview of? Um, so we wanted to include this one. Francis has uh, been our muse, our narrator for seven Kitchen Sisters specials. Um, the Hidden Kitchens Project, the Keepers Project, these hour-long specials that go up on NPR, that go up on PRX, and she is the voice that presents them. And um, so we just wanted to bring in this little moment. Welcome to Hidden Kitchens, the raw and the cooked. A new hour of stories produced by the Kitchen Sisters, Nikki Silva and Davia Nelson. Kitchens that suddenly pop up, kitchens that stay underground to survive, kitchens that are the keepers of a culture, and cooking traditions that spring from the most unlikely moments of history. I'm your host, Frances McDormand. We begin at the crossroads. The Kitchen Sisters take us to Clarksdale, Mississippi, where barbecue, the blues, and a kind of Lebanese meatloaf meet. Kibby at the crossroads. A Delta Kitchen Vision. Lebanese food, we make it every Sunday, make kibbe, cabbage rolls. When I get depressed, I make grape leaves. I'm Pat Davis, Abe's Barbecue in Clarksville, Mississippi, at the famous corner of 49 and 61. We've been in business since 1924. My father was from Zahali, Lebanon came to America in the early 1900s. They moved to Clarksdale. They were doing good peddling. And back then, the Lebanese people mostly were peddlers. 1924, my father opened up a barbecue a restaurant. This is the main highway where the crossroads are. And we think that that's where Robert Johnson made a deal with the devil to play good blues music. Robert Johnson used to sit around where those sycamore trees were, playing his blues guitar, drinking a bud, and eating one of our barbecues. They said the blues was born here, the clocks did. We have a blue museum here. I don't want no more blues. I have a blue when I was young. We used to have the blues in the field, in the old country. My mother singing all that sad songs, I'll never forget it. Cutting the wheat, picking the grapes. My name is Shafiq Shamoun. I live in Clarksdale since 1954. Me and my wife, Louise, we got Shamoun's Rest Haven. I would say the oldest restaurant in this delta. Great raw kibbe, great tabbouleh. Uh, we go there every January on the way to our Delta. Okay, we're excited. <laughs> You guys are really hanging in there as listeners. I'm so impressed because it's hard to, it's so weird 
isn't it, listening? I mean, it's such a magnetic thing. It's such a powerful thing, but it's like, where do you put your eyes? What the hell? You know, it's easy. If you go to sleep, we won't take it personally. Really, it's, I mean, these are bedtime stories. I don't think they're having a problem, Davia. I think they're really enjoying that. Show of hands. <laughs> okay. I, I think we're at the halfway point of our life's work, so hang in, gang. <laughs> no, there's, I think, two more series. I just don't want to overwhelm people because it's, you know. They one, I want to see the next one. Go, go, go. <laughs> Look, see, Weenie Royale. Aren't you glad you stayed awake for that one? <laughs> I want some so much. You want to try, Weenie Royale, yeah. So just to say, again, where do our stories come from? And one of the, going back to the idea of the commandments, say everything out loud. I was getting a haircut back to the salons. <laughs> and um, I was with someone new. I'd never met her before. Her name was Akemi Tamarabuchi. And, you know, you start chatting each other up. And what do you do? And what do you do? And I said, well, I make radio stories. And we're doing a series called Hidden Kitchens. And I described it. And she just looked at me and she said, Weenie Royale. My name is Akemi Tamari Buchi, and I'm third generation Japanese American. During World War II, my family was interned um, in Tule Lake internment camp. I'm positive that so many of the dishes that I grew up eating stemmed from what they had in camp and how they incorporated that into their tastes. Fried bologna with a little sugar and a little soy sauce on top, hot dogs and everything. They use things like ketchup and hot water for soup bases. We eat ketchup on everything. <laughs> Weenie Royale and Hamburger Royale, they're my favorites. Sunday mornings we always had sliced hot dogs mixed with eggs with soy sauce and a little oyster sauce. Stir fried in with some onions over rice. My father was Ito Ikimoto. Everybody called him Ed. He made that his official name after the war. He was a grocer. He had three grocery stores, and uh, he lost them all, of course. And my name's Howard Ikimoto. After the war, a lot of the Japanese came back to places like Sacramento, and they had no jobs. And a lot of them got pickup trucks and became gardeners. When I was 12 years old, I would go every Saturday to work with my father. Every lunch, all the Japanese gardeners would meet in front of people that they were mowing lawns for. We used to eat rice with uh, one plum in the middle and then maybe have a slice of Spam, corned beef hash out of a can. That was part of our main diet in camp. And while they were having their lunch, they would talk about the camps, which was the prime of their life. My name is Tammy Takahashi. I'm a native of San Francisco. I went to uh, UC Berkeley in the 30s, <laughs> the depths of depression. I lived my whole life here, except for the four years of uh, World War II. Everybody, if they had a drop of Japanese blood, 1 16th, we were all gathered up and put into camps. Our camp, Topaz, each person was given a tin pie plate that held our meals. Even now, 70 years later, if I look at a tin pie plate, it brings back memories. Hidden Kitchens. I ask, uh, I ask to... Uh, them to use this photograph tonight because it, it, this is around the time that I, w I met the ladies. And when I saw this photograph, I was really intrigued by the fact that Nikki had a camera and Davia had the microphone. And I hadn't thought about the fact that there was other ways to archive the interviews that you were doing. And so do you, do you think of yourself as a more um, visual member of the team? Are you archiving as you go more with the camera? 
than with a microphone as well? I mean, would you separate what you do in that way or no? I, well, yes and no, but yes. Yes and no. <laughs> About you guys, we're talking about here. But I always here. take pictures. I'm always taking photographs. And I was, when I met Davy, I was really into film and making films. So yes, I'm a visual person. And I have always had a little private theory uh, some of you can back me up. You, if you go to an NPR convention, a PRX convention, any kind of radio podcast convention, there are so many people wearing glasses. I mean, that is a remarkable amount of people. And I have a theory that in part people who don't have such great eyes have really acute ears and kind of go in another direction. <laughs> okay, so... Hold and on. I said that Wait. to Fran, and she didn't you got buy a, it. And you got a lot of radio people out here in the audience. I don't know. I don't see you guys with all with glasses, but... <laughs> Wait. Go on. Okay. I think she's produced... Case closed. Archival evidence. There you go. That will be in the Library of Congress, too. <laughs> so the next story was one that when you, when you first said this to me, I think, and to anyone that heard the name of this next series, it just was a very thrilling prospect. The Hidden World of Girls. Girls and the Women They Become. Girls and the Women They Become. Coming of Age, Rituals and Rites of Passage, Secret Identities, Women Who Crossed a Line, Blazed a Trail, Changed the Tide. That was the tag of that series. And I think this is where, this is a really great moment to talk more about that visual world that you were, were hoping to bring into the stories with this piece. Well, I want to say one thing about this, too, this trip. We haven't really described yet what it is, but you'll hear. Um, Maybe I'll talk about it after. Okay. Okay. It's your show, baby. Hi. My name is Brooke Spotted Eagle. I belong to a women's society on my reservation in South Dakota, the Braveheart Women's Society. My mother is one of the founding grandmothers who brought it back to life. I saw the hidden world of girls and think this would be an amazing opportunity to share with other Native women a Ishnati coming of age ceremony for our girls. Thanks. Bye. Childhood was really rough, lost and floating and drifting and just trying to survive. Didn't um, feel like I had a place on earth. My name is Marissa Joseph. I'm 21. I live in Ihang Duan territory in South Dakota. I was adopted as a newborn. A large part of my life I was kind of just bouncing between family members. I was a pretty strong alcoholic in my early teens and just on a really bad path. I didn't know who I was and what I was looking for and what I needed and had really wanted to, to not live anymore. In the summer of my 14th year, I went through Shanti and I felt like I was found. In the Braveheart Society a long time ago, the women would retrieve the dead from the battlefield and do what they could to help the family. In a way, we're doing the same thing, bringing back our people from emotional death. My name is Faith Spotted Eagle. We're in Lake Andes on the Ihangtua homeland near the Missouri River. It was in 1994. We went around three or four states and we interviewed grandmas. We asked them what they remembered of Ishnati coming of age. In the old days, as soon as a girl got her first moon, her first menses, the family would take them immediately and you would isolate yourself from the rest of the camp and they would begin teaching it. So we symbolically set up one camp a year and we have the girls come in for four days. One over to the north, bring it back, one over to the north. There. Yeah. From the very beginning, you need to put up your own teepee, your own lodge, you need to have that strength to house yourself. Well, where's your door at? On the girls' teepees, you have to have 13 poles. We use 13 poles because we have 13 moons in a year. See, they're cold. That's why we call Fast it a girls. moon camp because it's a special time for women. Quickly. To learn about themselves. The, the rain's coming. 
these four days, it's their sacred time. The girls can't feed themselves, they can't touch food, they can't drink water themselves. The mother or the auntie or whoever they bring with them has to do it for them. I was like, oh my God, I don't want to do this. Your mom has to feed you and give you water, and I just didn't like my mom. These four days, it's treating them like a baby one last time before they become young women. The feeding, it became kind of a little heartbreak, that bittersweet feeling because no longer will she be my little girl to feed anymore. You really began to start the foundation of what that adult relationship is with a mother and a daughter. So we were so amazed to get this telephone call, and Brooke Spotted Eagle qualified it. She said, I have to ask the elders if it's okay, because she's young. She was in her early 20s and had gone through Ishnati and, and really wanted to get this word out, but had to check it out with her mom, who's Faith, Spotted Eagle, and the other grandmas. And so they said yes, and it's a four-day thing, um, but there were certain things that you couldn't photograph, and there were certain things that you couldn't do. And uh, and so it was kind of tricky, you know, oh, oops, I accidentally got that tree in the photo. And, uh, but anyway, fourth day of the ceremony, well, first of all, there, the gram, one grandma, Teresa Hart, came and measured all the girls and made special dresses for each one. She wanted, they want each one to have their own special dress. And then on the fourth day, the mom or the auntie takes the girl into the teepee, one at a time. They bathe them and wash them, dress them, do their hair, put um, uh, paint on their forehead, and they talk to them about um, what they were like as babies and little girls and how, um, how wonderful they were and, and talk to them about the promise of their lives and their futures in this very positive way. And then the girls emerge from this teepee and they feed actual food. The whole community comes around, and it's the first time they've touched food in four days, and they actually feed and serve the entire community and become women. I, and I'm really interested also in the young boys of the community and how they take and part in the ceremony. It's a, girls, it's a girls' ceremony, but all these little boys are there, and um, kind of bigger brothers. And the little boys are fire tenders. They can't, you know, go in certain areas, but they tend the fire all night. And one little boy goes around every morning and sings to open, to, to wake all the girls up. And it's just a very moving, we should have this. It should be required. It, it should, it, we, should have, we should have this in the world. Um, it, it, but one, one thing that when you were talking about the photography, so... Uh, the little, there's also a lot of little girls there who are watching and mentoring, you know, the bigger girls are mentoring them. And these little girls, seven and eight, became fascinated with the camera. And, you know, finally I just said, well, here. And they started taking the most incredible photos because they could get up close to the grandmas and they could get up close to the things I wasn't supposed to photograph. And they were fabulous. I mean, and, and I have to say there was a little... Uh, it was four days. At the beginning, there was a lot of, um, you know, sidestepping and some of the moms weren't... Really they were suspicious. Sh suspicion. But then once the little kids got involved and everybody was sort of documenting the, their own community, it, everything changed. Everything changed. Anyway, hand over the tools. Hand over the tools. Commend, commandment hand over the tools. number 25. Commandment 24. So this is, the, uh, this is some of the stories. Tell us some of the other stories. And, the, and this was hosted by Tina Fey, which was a brilliant choice, I think. They do really good casting with their hosts, I have to say. <laughs> um, what were some of the other stories besides Braveheart? Just give us a couple. Horses, unicorns, and dolphins. Um, this, oh, I'm gonna, Janet, what is Janet's last name? She teaches here in town and she was a marine biologist, and she would get love letters from girls saying, when I grow up, I want to be you because I want to swim with dolphins. I'm, and 
I love horses, I love unicorns, I love dolphins. And so we were trying to get into the psyche of young girls. And I'm so that. glad that they said they wanted to be her and not a dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> because some of the girls I've met. And um, we, did a story, <laughs> we did a story about traveler girls in Ireland and the lives of those, yeah. So th this is one of the commandments I love because it's so clear, and I think it, it's obvious now, after hearing them tell their stories, is that they see a, a lot farther than 10 feet, but in the, in the making of, which is the next series, is the making of the Bay Bridge, a jar of jam, a surfboard, an iPhone, and these, and an opera. Tell us a little bit more about these, it especially was, the one that we're gonna be listening to. Yeah, it was a series we did, it was a big, uh, public project, maybe people here in the room were part of it, Localore, and you were, it was a community collaborative in lots of towns, and our project was the making of what people make in the Bay Area and why. So we're going to play just a little touch of a story called The Making of the Homobile. A ho mobile <laughs> A story of transportation, civil rights, and glitter. And just to say that this story is back in, I want to say 2007, 8, what, Nathan? Okay, yeah, 2007 or 8 or 13, <laughs> time flies when you're making a jar of jam. Um, and um, at that point, there wasn't Uber, there wasn't Lyft, and a lot of drag queens and people in that community were not getting picked up by any cabs, by anybody, and um, so someone started what ultimately came to be called Uber for Drag Queens, and this is the making of the homobile. Hey, homobiles, Lenny. 859 Union. Yeah, hey, could you text me that? One babe, one bag, going to SFO. I will give it to the driver, and they'll be there in about 10 minutes. I was having a hair appointment. I was getting my hair blown out at Dina's Glamorama. My friend said, Lenny Breedlove has started Homobile. Call if you need a ride. And so I told them where I was and I needed a car. They sent, I think it was Musty Chiffon. Yes, it was Musty Chiffon. She showed up and was my driver. So all of a sudden this person who I'd known in clubs, we were driving in a car and talking with each other. They ask for a suggested donation. And of course, you just want to give them the entire contents of your pocketbook because they're so lovely. See what I tell you? Traffic. My name is Lenny Breedlove. I run Homobiles, a community ride service for the LGBT, IQQ, LMOP, QRST community, and its allies in San Francisco. You do not have to be a big fat queer to get a ride from Homobiles, but it does help. No, just kidding. But you know, you need to understand that the real reason that we are here is for people that don't get rides normally from anyone else. And so, if you're putting on all this padding, high heels, a wig, and three sets of false eyelashes, and a bunch of glitter, you are high priority at Homo Bills. First I was afraid, I was petrified, kept thinking I could never live without you by my side. But then I spent so many My name is Godi the Chocolatier. We're at the stud in San Francisco, and right now you're seeing me in my night drag. I'm wearing um, gold lame pants and a platinum wig and lots of fabulous makeup. At nighttime, when I go out, and, and this is how I look, you know, fabulous and avant-garde, not a cab will take me. We have over 20 people that drive their cars. It's all by donation. All the drivers are volunteers because of drag queens, sex workers, trans folks, queers, not being picked up, given a hard time, harassed. It was really important for us to get our folks around safely. A lot of cabs and stuff won't take people with, you know, they don't like glitter in their cabs, they don't like all kinds of bicycles and whatever they, you know. So. I'm not a big glitter person, but, you know, I wear sequins, so I'm sure I leave sequins in many places. My name's Justin Vivian Bond. I'm a trans genre artist. People get freaked out by glitter, and I don't blame the drivers because if you get a lot of glitter or makeup or body paint in your car, it's hard to get out. 
I guess that's one of the drawbacks of the carriage trade. The Homobile. I think about the carriage trade every time I walk through the carriage entrance of the Library of Congress. I just sort of see a homobile driving up at some point. Maybe it'll go in the Smithsonian. You know, the public radio podcasting world is a really collaborative one. Um, there's this great saying, Terry Tempest Williams, the writer of the West, says this um, wonderful quote that we love, collaboration is the only way forward. And um, I was just thinking, so we aired the homobile and then the moth wanted to do a story on the hidden world of girls and so we all went to New York. Natalie Channon is here with us tonight from Alabama. She came and told a story. Linny Breedlove came and told that story on stage with the moth. We talked about things anyway. There's so much cross-pollination and connection between so many of the people um, that do this work. It's part of the beauty of it. It's, I, well, uh, I'm gonna cry again. Um, I would just say, if you're starting out and you're looking for a world to be part of, it's a pretty amazing community and worth exploring. And building community through storytelling, there's a lot to be said for it. And you kind of, I think we felt very lucky to be part of it. And again, I just have to say to all of you we've collaborated with in this room, how lucky we've been. Yeah, and I, you know, we, we forgot to, that personal stuff I was talking about at the beginning, we kind of missed the middle part of it, but I'm going to just say something. You, know, you, you can add if you want to. One of the things that I really think it's important for young people to know about this partnership is that it was a collaborative partnership between two women who did not have to compromise their ideas of who they wanted wanted to be and, and the life that they wanted to have. Davia made it possible for Nikki to have a family. Nikki made it possible for Davia to travel the world. They didn't have to compromise or sacrifice for what they wanted to be. And I think that's a, an extraordinary thing. And I'll be sexist to say, it was a lot because they were two women. I'm sorry, but I think it might be true. And their work, the work I believe is, it, you're, you're saying that there is a huge collaborative effort and it's only because, and it's been built now upon what you've built with your careers as well. So now we go to the, yes, that's true, don't you give me that funny look. <laughs> the Keepers is the next um, world that they have ventured into because they've always depended and on I, the kindness of archivists. I would just add right now, it's not just we've all, we've always relied on the kindness of archivists. We are all relying right now on the what? The badassness of archivists. <laughs> on the, on the, who these stalwart people are, these stewards. What the uh, keeper's little tagline, um, activists, archivists, rogue librarians, curators, collectors, and historians, keepers of the culture, guardians of history, large and small, protectors of the freedom of information and expression. That's the task that the keepers. Um, I'm just gonna take a moment, Nathan Dalton. Nathan, will you stand up? Yeah, you have to, Nathan. Nathan. Nathan is our kitchen brother. He produces everything with us. He produced this whole series with us. It was Nathan who named the series The Keepers. And I don't know if you noticed when we, we were watching um, the photos with the music, there was all those keepers of the day. Like b the idea was baseball cards, but instead of baseball players, it would be librarians and <laughs> archivists and you'd know about them. And so Nathan designed all those. And then Brandy Howell, Brandy, please stand up. We produce everything with Brandy Howell, all of it, all the research. Brandy is an archive freak and, and an incredible producer, and she has her own podcast, which um, Echo Chamber, which is wonderful about music and uh, what it means socially. And Nathan is a great producer as well. 
doing yeah, this film. Is, one of the one of the great things about the podcast now, when you when you start listening to their podcast, which you all, if you haven't done, you will be doing now. You always shout out new people who are coming up and have really that you find familiar, and so they lead us. They lead all of us to new podcasts, and it's great. So, here's the hip hop archive. Yeah, here's the first uh, little sample from the first of the Keeper series. Every art form has their standards that they've placed in the canon. Mathematics, science, everybody has their greats, and somebody placed them there. People in visual art world say, hey, okay, this is what's going in the Louvre. This is it. And I think hip hop needs the same thing. This is the archive. Archiving the underground is what we do. The Hip Hop Archive began at UCLA, late 90s. I taught urban speech communities there. Students said, we want to do work on hip hop. I said, that's performance, but it's not a speech community. They said, we'll be back. They came back with the most amazing projects. They showed the elements of hip hop, rapping, emceeing, poetry or rhyming, b-boy, b-girl dance, and graffiti art, and what it meant to their lives. I'm Marcelina Morgan, founding director of the Hip Hop Archive and professor of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. My students, when they were graduating, would say, I collected this. This is from hip hop. Boom box. You have to keep it. Turntable. I'm a linguistic anthropologist. Anthropologists love material culture. Adidas. I couldn't throw it away. Spray paint they use with graffiti. So I started having all this stuff. Then all these students were like, well, I think it should be called an archive because an archive is important. Pieces of hip hop history. I remember when Marcy shared her idea with me and I thought, oh my God, I'm no fan of hip hop. But you didn't have to be Albert Einstein to realize that this was a brilliant idea, the world's first archive of the hip hop and rap movement. Imagine if someone had thought of this when jazz was at its zenith. Why don't we have the jazz archive at Harvard? Of course it would have been turned down, but in retrospect, they would have been a genius. I'm Henry Louis Gates Jr., professor at Harvard, director of the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research. Why hip hop at Harvard? Summon the Elders. My name is Mary Ruth Schuler Dieter. I'm 97 years old. We traveled on the horses, riding down in the mountains of Kentucky, a very poor country. I was delivering books to the children. Pay for a librarian. It was one of the works of President Roosevelt. Our problem is to put to work three and one half million employable persons, men and women, who are now on the relief rolls. In the Depression, those horrible years after 1929, the Appalachians were hit so hard. Coal mines were being shut down. Lots of people in dire poverty. Eleanor Roosevelt decided to help create projects that would specifically benefit women and children. Eleanor Roosevelt felt very strongly about the Pack Horse Library Project. If the women are willing to do this because it's going to help their neighbors, I think we'll win out. The Pack Horse Librarians, mostly women, rode circuits around 18 to 20 miles. They followed animal paths, fence lines. They would stuff their saddlebags or a pillowcase with books and strike out by horseback or mule to provide library service to the remote areas of the Kentucky mountains. Going into the Appalachian Mountains of Kentucky was going back in time. No running water, no electricity, very few schools. Families lived way up in the mountains. A creek bed, that would be the road. We forded Greasy Creek, take the horses across. We wore boots and pants. And they got those books there. <laughs> the 
the Library of Congress is a multimedia encyclopedia. These are the tentacles of the nation. You just don't often get to use the word tentacles, <laughs> is why that quote is up there. We were looking for quotes about the Library of Congress, and there it was. It was so obvious. There may be better ones, but they don't have tentacles in them. <laughs> Radiotopia from PRX. So in 2014, I think, we began podcasting, and this is our network, Radiotopia. It's a, Joe Richmond and Radio Diaries is also part of that network. It's a curated uh, network of podcasters, and um, we are so proud to be part of it. And podcasting, uh, I mean, What's we've the lived... name of your podcast, Nikki? Oh, um, the Kitchen Sisters present. Yes, good, good, good call. <laughs> um, anyway, it's it's been great. I mean, we've we've moved through a lot of technology in our forty years, and a lot of platforms and mediums, and we really love radio and are still part of radio, but podcasting has really opened things up in interesting ways and allowed us to do longer pieces and spur the moment pieces and use our archive in new ways and, you know, to also feature people, like you said, people we like, you know, just turn people on to things that we're hearing that we love. We're just going to run through a couple of slides really quickly. Um, these are all in our podcast, and perhaps you'll go listen. We, Crimea River, Martha Ham, where are you? We, there you are. Um, this is a story called Crimea River about three pioneering river activists and the damming of wild rivers in the West. And Martha led us to this story, and I don't know how many people saw that article about Utah and water in the Guardian on Sunday. Martha was the lead voice of that and has been just working for Champion. the environment and climate. So here's to you, Martha, and thank you. Thank you, you for your work. <laughs> the um, other thing that, that it's allowed us to do is to just, this was from um, 2020, the, uh, the lightning complex fires that happened in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And we did a whole collaboration with a museum and a local photographer and interviewed people who had lost their homes. Everyone brought in an object that uh, they, they had found in the ashes that spurred stories of their life in the mountains, their, their beliefs, their history. Uh, it was a very moving project. But this is the kind of thing you can do with um, when you have long form that you can just go for it. And we put this one in because um, we're, our archive is going into the American Folk Life Center here at the Library of Congress. And it's not that the AIDS quilt is in the Library of Congress, but every single piece of the archive of the making of the AIDS quilt, which is such a phenomenal... I urge you all to take a look, is there. And during the pandemic, we did this story about Gert McMullen, who was one of the first people that did a stitch on the original AIDS quilt, and she has been the keeper of it for all these decades. And she took um, all this material that she had left over from the quilt and was one of the first people making masks in the pandemic. So we want to urge For medical you. workers and for the homeless. And then... Um, there was a guy, Ed James, who lives here in uh, Washington, D.C., sent us an article from the DCS by journalist and photographer Valerie Plesch, who's here tonight, about a group of Afghan women refugees, journalists, artists, activists, designers, all these young women that were had broken through from what was traditional Afghan life and now with the takeover of the Taliban in Kabul, were threatened and were on lists of people who would be killed or taken. Anyway, they were within days and hours pulled out of Kabul, and they are here, and there are several of them with us tonight. And just I'm going to ask Miriam to sign Miriam and your sisters, and Elham Karimi, musician and archivist. And it was such an honor to be part. 
I will also add that Maryam Yusufi is launching her fall line of clothing. Not only is she a journalist, <laughs> she's a fashion designer. And so watch out for Maryam. And also there are, all these women came to um, the Washington area, the Virginian Washington era, area with, you know, a backpack, nothing. I mean, they just pulled up their roots and came here. And in Valerie's story, she started, people saw Valerie's stories as we did and wanted to come do it. But there, Marika Partridge and Lori Davis, are you guys here tonight? Okay. So they are, oh, and Anna. Anna, you're here. Anna, Anna starts out our piece. Um, also journalist, Anna had a car show. Uh, she's obsessed with cars, and she was broadcasting a car show in um, Kabul, and is now here and has been acting in a film since she's come here. But Marika opened up her home, and Anna and her sister Taban uh, have been living with her, and Lori Davis opened up her home. Elham has been there, and other friends. Anyway, it's been this network of people who just hear someone's story and realize they have something that can change someone's life and change someone's fate, and they offer it. So um, we're honored to feel Thank you, you for sharing the you. stories. Show the girls the snakes. So there was a book called The Hidden Kitchens, and now there is a new book. I like to think of it as possibly a memoir, <laughs> but I don't think they want to think of it as a memoir. It's a book in progress. It's a book in progress. I don't think we need to explain anything more about Show the Girls the Snakes. I think perhaps I'll read an excerpt from it. We asked Fran if she would read as the close of tonight the intro from Show the Girls the Snakes. 1978. It was late, it was hot. The redwoods were curtained in darkness as we waited in the driveway. We weren't about to give up, or were we? Finally, a big pickup truck rumbled in. The younger man sprang out of the cab and began unloading the tool chest in the back. The older guy took his sweet time making his way over to us. We were 22 years old, all fired up and ready to record. It had taken us three months of constant calling to convince this infamous father-son lumberjacking team, Les and Stevie Liebenberg, to let us come do a father-son oral history with them. They were the last of a dying breed, the only ones left to top trees and worked the woods in the old-fashioned way, and we were there to chronicle their rites and rituals before they disappeared into the mist of history. We were on a mission to document the vanishing traditions of work in our region, fishing, farming, rodeo, lumbering for our local community, and for our local community radio station. It was our second interview ever. The first had been with an 89-year-old blind man who owned some local greenhouses that were about to come down. We were lucky he couldn't see how nervous we were and how many times we dropped the microphone during the interview. <laughs> Les and Stevie led us into the house. We threaded our way past the six-foot piles of old newspapers, the five-foot towers of Quaker Oats containers, and the haystacks of rifles resting in the corners. The guys were pooped. They'd been up a tree for the last 12 hours. During summer, they worked long days till last light and didn't make it home till nearly 10 p.m. It was 10 p.m. now, and we were a long way off from an interview. You didn't have to be Studs Terkel to know that. <laughs> we were way up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. The cell phone wasn't going to be invented for another 25 years. Had we mentioned to anyone where we were going? <laughs> we had come prepared. 
You could ask us any question about the lumbering history of the region and we would tell you more than you wanted to know. The redwood blight of 27, the innovations in two-man saws that came about in the 40s, and the impact of the building craze during the 60s that was mowing down the old forest at an alarming rate. Less than Stevie Liebenberg, father and son woodsman, could clearly see that we had done our homework. And never had two people been less interested in talking about lumber. <laughs> Les wanted to talk about a theory he developed while ascending trees. It explained the metaphysics of being. He called it the science. He carried a pencil and index cards in his flannel shirt pocket to take down his thoughts as they came to him up in the high branches. The trouble was, the pockets didn't have buttons, and the notes on his revelations kept slipping out as he was hanging from the tall trees. Les's wife had left him. Stevie's wife, too. Okay, it was time for our interview to begin. Nikki pushed record and asked, How has lumbering changed in the 50 years you've been in the business? Stevie? Can I get you girls a, pip a Pepsi? Davia, what is the most memorable tree that you have encountered over the decades, and why? <laughs> Les, Stevie, show the girls the snakes. <laughs> the snakes? Stevie, the rattlesnakes. Nope, we hadn't told anyone where we were going, and now it was pushing 11 p.m. <laughs> they led us past the pyramids of Quaker Oats, and we wove our way back around the rifles. How had we missed the floor-to-ceiling terrarium bathed in orange heat lamps with the boa constrictor and the python coiling on bare branches? And there... Convorting in the tool chest that they had custom fit to the back of their pickup were the rattlesnakes. All 36 of them. <laughs> Even though three of the snakes had bitten him, Stevie had a knack with him. He was training the snakes to pull miniature Conestoga wagons. and to dangle from a trapeze, wearing senorita gowns. <laughs> they were starting to get regular bookings at the Rotary and Kiwanis Club, and were taking the snakes on the lumberjack rodeo circuit as well. Time seemed to stop as the men told us their dreams. There's a moment on the tape, captured 40 years ago, on an Electro Voice DO56 microphone when you hear one of us ask, can I touch the rattlesnakes? <laughs> we were so lost in the thrall of the story, so mesmerized by their world, so taken with the intensity and vision of father and son. Over a glass tool chest of snakes, we talked about nippy and nibbles, the Rattler families, and their innate talent for showbiz. <laughs> and we talked about lumbering and the vanished forest, vanishing forest, their family, and so much more. It's now 2022. The Liebenberg's business card, the reel-to-reel -reel, reel -reel tapes, and the handwritten transcripts we did back then sit patiently in our archive the accidental archive we've built up over the decades of telling radio stories together. Most of the time, we tell people where we're headed. Sometimes, we just go. <laughs> Gentle listeners, the Kitchen Sisters.
Yeah, yeah. All right, Davia, May, she wants to do this. Have a seat. Give it up. Go on. Go on. Do what you need to do, girl. I, I just want to say thank you. I have pages and pages of names, but you've all been so patient. I'm just going to do one last thank you to the Library of Congress and the American Folklife Center and to everyone who's been so welcoming of our archive and who are our new collaborators, colleagues, and friends, and um, who are protecting our nation's heritage on so many levels. I'm looking out at the Capitol, seeing how close the Library of Congress is thinking back to what we've all been through, and it just makes me appreciate what you all are doing and what you go through every day to do it. And if we can add a few rattlesnakes to your day, we can die happy. No, thank you so much for taking on our, I wanna, our work. I'd just like to thank, I, I just want to say one more time, thank you, Nathan, and thank you, Brandy. Thank you, Mark Hand, the head of our board of directors for the Kitchen Sisters Productions. And thank you to my daughter, Molly Prentice, for all of, all of the time you just let us go. So I like to think of these two as a rock band. <laughs> and you've just been at a concert. And you want an encore, don't you? I talked to the Rattlers for about two years, and then I found out they didn't have ears. We study the personality of the Rattler. We don't study their anatomy. We hardly know anything about their anatomy. It's not important if they're a boy or a girl, even. It's just keeping their mouth closed, <laughs> keeping their fangs from biting us. This is Eric. Eric trusts me. In the woods, when we take them for walks, we'll turn them loose, like three at a time, let them get their exercise, smell their wild scent. They'll wander around, and they will actually come back to us. Stevie started it. Mm -hmm. uh, we found a rattler on one of our jobs. It was quite intriguing to have that rattler in that can, and so Stevie, pretty soon he got the idea if he could put a bridle on its head, then he could pick it up and pet it. Well, that's Uncle Sam's head turning to the left. The third head? Right, yeah. third one over. He tows a wagon. So that's what those covered wagons are? Yeah, they're rattlers tow them. When the rattlers tow a wagon or wear a gown, Cupid here, the one sitting at my left hand, she wore a uh, senorita gown. And we have rattlers that ride a trapeze. We'd like to see a series, something like Lassie, mm -hmm. you know, only with Rattlers. Mm -hmm. The performing Rattler is the whole idea. Did you see a Rattler yawn there? He's getting ready to yawn again, maybe. There he is. There you go. They're very, very edgy. They rattle and they'll stand up like they're going to bite anything that moves. And yet, when you break through that barrier. They're very, very affectionate. Could I touch the rattler? Archival evidence. <laughs> <laughs>